morning. Uh, they say that the best gifts come in very small packages. So Mother's, your Mother's Day gift is going to come in an ultimately small package. You won't even see it because Mother's Day came and went and we didn't have a, a gift to give to you, but, but what we do have are two special intangibles. The first one is our boys and girls have come up to join us for a few minutes this morning to sing for us, to sing for you, their moms, their grandmas, and also a little later on after we worship and have opportunity to look to the Lord, we have Brother Mark Handy with us who for many of you is not a stranger. He's been here many, many times before, his wife, and we're thankful for their ministry. And we'll hear from them. So you're not going to lose out. Mothers, you come this morning, maybe you wanted a begonia or something else. Your opportunity was the yard sale yesterday. It came, it went. May the Lord bless you and give you a special blessing throughout this day. Keep your hearts open because he has something in store for you. So boys and girls, would you come to sing for us?
going to sing a prayer for you, okay? Um, I'm sure there are a lot of mothers in here that have kids up here. And if you're not a, a physical mother, I'm sure that you're a spiritual mother in some sense of a way, or a spiritual parent. Um, but we want to pray together, and we can sing a song together. It's called The Blessing. We can just sing that, uh, that verse, and then the kids can go after that. But um, I was thinking about this song and the context for the song. Um, it's God teaching Moses how to pray for the Israelites. Um, oftentimes when we sing this song, uh, I think we sing, The Lord bless me and keep me and keep his face shining upon me. But that's not the words of the song. The song is, The Lord bless you and keep you. Um, and so as we sing it together, um, pray it and sing it for someone else here. Um, for one of these up here, maybe your kid is, is grown, maybe they're sitting in the first few rows, maybe they're sitting in the back, I don't know where they are. Um, but let's pray it together for someone else, it doesn't have to be for you. Um, and if you haven't noticed, uh, I won't be able to sing very much. <laughs> um, you'll have to, you'll have to kind of take the lead from me on this one, because my voice is a little bit gone. Uh, but let's stand together and let's sing this together. Um, and kids, I'll, I'll dismiss you halfway through the song so you don't have to stand there the time. Unless the teachers want them to. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll sing it one time and then the, the kids can go on downstairs. But let's let's sing this and then let's pray it for our children of our church.
Mark comes and ministers to us, there are some announcements. Firstly, I should say thank you to the many of you that helped yesterday at the sale uh, from 6.30 in the morning till, I don't know what time you guys finished with the pickups at night, but 8 o'clock or whatever, uh, or the drop-offs, I should say. It was uh, a blessing all day long to be able to be together. That I sent someone an email and I said, it, it's nice that we can uh, help camp and raise support to send children to camp, but I, I think the most enjoyable thing is just the fellowship, just to be together and uh, serve the Lord together. And, uh, some have said it's, it's as nice a day as our church picnic. I don't know. Is our church picnic that bad? <laughs> or is the street uh, the yard sale that good? I don't know. But thank you to every one of you that have worked so hard, and cleaned up so well. It's, it's really amazing. We're thankful to the Lord for what he's done. Uh, tonight we have our evening service. I know it's Mother's Day, and that might, that might require some other demands upon some of you. But Lord willing, 6.30, we'll be here for Mother's Day evening service. Come if you can, if you can. Prayer meeting on Monday, Monday at 7.30. On Tuesday, we go to the nursing home in the morning. Nursing home meeting, Tuesday morning. Bible study Wednesday night at 7.30. And Thursday evening is the youth prayer. It's on Zoom. It's not for the youth necessarily, it's for their parents. Youth, parents, prayer. And so if you do not know what I'm talking about, and you're a parent of one of the young people, or would like to, no, uh, if you're a parent of one of the young people, and you would like to join in prayer for the young people, and you don't know how to do that, talk to my son. And he'll give you what you need to know as far as Thursday evening prayer meeting. It'll only be about 30 minutes, I understand. A short time of prayer, joining your faith together. That God will bless our young people. And, and he will continue to bless them. Saturday, I'm sorry, Friday, youth meeting and kids club, Friday night. Saturday morning, ladies uh, meeting and breakfast at 9.30 here at church. Next Sunday night, Hands at Work, uh, organization that uh, is in Africa, different, different countries in Africa. But they will be here with us, Lord willing, a week from tonight, next Sunday night. And then, uh, need I say more, is that enough? Maybe, I hope not, because we are looking forward to Memorial Day at Pilgrim Camp. If there are any of you that would like to still go, it's free, it's a work weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, no work, but at camp, and then Monday. Uh, Memorial Day weekend, two weeks from this weekend. I don't think I'll be there, but a lot of you will go, I hope, and I, I'm sure, Brother Paul told me that, there is still room in the boathouse, but only in the boathouse. Now, uh, get your room if you want one there, and uh, let camp know of your desire to come and to help serve and work there Memorial Day weekend. And there, there are needs at camp. I know the staff meeting yesterday delineated some of them. Our sister Gisela is particularly concerned about the second period, the girls, village counselors, because she's the head counselor. And so she's looking for counselors to help her, and they need a couple, maybe a junior counselor also, I don't know, but you can see Sister Gisela, if you think you'd like to go to camp second period and be a counselor, or if you think you're a junior counselor, let her know, let her know. And uh, a couple other, just yet, bear with me please, I know they're lengthy, but, uh, Sister Pauline Harris, her father passed away, and the funeral service is next Friday, this coming Friday, I should say, Friday night. And the address and the details are on the bulletin board. You can look at that if you'd like to go to, to be part of that service. It's a, it's, it says it's from three o'clock in the afternoon till, till seven at night. But I think the actual service part is, is just from like six to seven, okay? So you can come in the afternoon, but it's from six to seven is the, the funeral service uh, per se. So keep, keep that in mind. Sign up sheet for the lunch at the picnic. I know, I know, June, now we're in June, but 
We've got to order food and get things prepared. It'll come before we know it. June the 10th, Valley Stream State Park. And you should all be there. I mean, I don't know why you all weren't here yesterday. You better have had a good excuse, but I hope you all can come to the picnic. And you'll see how much fun that is too. And uh, if you can come and like to stay for lunch, there's, again, sign-up sheets on the bulletin board or the back table where you can uh, let Sister Joyce or whoever is responsible for it know that you would like to come and you'd like to eat, so we'll have enough food for you also. Finally, in closing, before we pray, uh, there's, there's a newsletter on the back table. It's called World Outreach Ministries. It's Brother Mark. Many of you get this in the mail and have gotten it for many years now. You've gotten the updates and the newsletters. But uh, you can determine whether you want it after Brother Mark speaks. But I, I would suggest that you take him on your heart and we pray for him and you keep informed. And to that end, there's not only the newsletter, it's not a new one, so if you're on the mailing list, you already got it. But uh, there's a sign-up sheet. If you did get it or don't get it, and you'd like to, either by snail mail uh, or maybe email, and you can sign up and print legibly so that there are no mistakes made. If you don't get the newsletter but would like to, uh, you can do that uh, before you leave today. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now we want to pray this morning for, uh, for several, that God will touch those that are in need of a physical touch. We're looking to the Lord to do that. Some of you know that my wife is supposed to have surgery the end of the month. And uh, the, the scans that came back, the last scans were really quite good. Uh, I, I should say very good. And the doctors have said her prognosis is excellent and uh, yet she needs further surgery, uh, and it will be. And it's an extensive surgery, but we're thankful. Uh, we're thankful for the Lord's help and for keeping uh, her and continuing to help her, and we want to continue to pray that the Lord will do that. Some of you have met uh, Sister Norma. She's not here this morning. She often comes and she carries an oxygen tank with her, and uh, she's having surgery on May 22nd to remove a lung. And it's a difficult surgery. We want to pray for Sister Norma and take her into your hearts and remember her. If you don't know who she is, the Lord knows. He knows who she is. So you don't have to figure it all out. But if you know her particularly, but all of us, we need to get under that burden and pray that God will lay his hand upon our sister and keep and help and strengthen her in her body. So, Lord, we look to you on behalf of our, our brothers and sisters. There are many others. But, Lord, you know each one by name. You know those who suffer, those, oh God, who are in need of your healing touch. We, we thank you for what you've done and for what you're doing, Lord. Help Sister Irene strengthen her body. Come to her, Lord. Come to each one. Thank you for all you've done for Brother Emilio. Continue to help Sister Joyce, Lord, we pray. Make her... Make her well, O oh God, make her well, we pray, to serve you with full strength, O oh God. Come to our sister Norma and help her, Jesus. You know her need, dear Lord, and we pray that you will lay your hand upon her. Dear Lord, heal Norma. Dear Jesus, you're able, and we're looking to you, Father, to glorify your name, glorify your name. Oh, Jesus, and each one, any others that are looking this way this morning for prayer, we Bring them to the throne of grace. We pray for Brian on his birthday today. Bless him, Lord. Bless him and help him, keep him. Lord, we just pray that you would do for him above and beyond what he could ask or think. So, Lord, we thank you for your family, the family of God. We pray that as we hear your word ministered to our hearts, that we'll go into them and sink deeply and change our lives by your word, we pray, Jesus, this day this day, and we thank you for it. Amen. I don't want to say anything more about introducing Brother Mark, because he, he'll do that himself, and I don't want to say what he has on his heart, so Brother Mark. God bless you. Okay.
So happy to be here with you. It's been a few years. <clears throat> we all know what we've been through <clears throat> in the country and with the pandemic and uh, curtailing travel and um, also some interesting things have happened with us and our work in India where we basically no longer are able to work there. Uh, they took the, the government has taken the foreign currency away, foreign currency number away from uh, about 20,000 mostly Christian ministries and churches in India so that no money can come in to support the gospel. So things have changed. The world is changing, but uh, Jesus remains the same. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and we keep uh, we're, uh, loving him and serving him, and he opens the doors where we can work for him. And I bring also greetings from Sister Colleen, who uh, please remember her in your prayers uh, as well. She has some issues in her health, but the Lord is good. She wishes she could be here, but uh, the best I can do is bring her greetings to you. But I want to thank you. I thank this church and Pastor Ernie and all of you have been a wonderful prayer support and even a financial support to the work of God that the Lord has had us involved in all, of, all these many years. And we've had to refocus from India. We're focused now in Africa. Uh, for a number of years, we've been helping a, a Bible school over there um, that is also a missionary training uh, school. They focus, they have a two-year program, and they bring in, many times they're new converts from out in the field that they're missionaries. They have 34 missionaries that they support full-time in different nations of uh, Africa. And uh, they, they recommend new converts to come and get trained, and the whole goal is to reach the unreached and go into areas that have not heard the gospel and plant churches for the Lord's sake and bring as many souls to Jesus as we can, right? This is the hour that we need to be working hard for the Lord and bringing souls to him and preaching the gospel because I believe we're in probably the last of the last days. Things are happening in accordance with the word of God, but we, we need to be ready and we need to be occupying until he comes and busy in the Lord's work. So right now our job as World Outreach Ministry is to support these missionaries that are out there in the field. We're helping them build simple uh, churches, not very expensive, made out of steel with corrugated roofs and also that doubles as school building. Many of them where they're going into these unreached places doesn't also have schooling for the children. So they use that as a way of outreach. Uh, planning schools and churches at the same time using those buildings. Uh, we're also providing um, transport in the way of motorbikes for these missionaries out in the bush. It's hard to get around. Uh, it, it's a lot of walking. Many of them do a lot of walking, but the motorbike helps them facilitate their ministries and evangelism and house visitation or going from uh, village to village and bringing the gospel. And uh, also we're helping build homes for the missionaries, simple homes that they can have a place to live and they can bring uh, other missionaries out there to assist them in the work. Right now we're helping to build three little homes in a, uh, a place called Naris, South Sudan. And there's a missionary from Harbinger's Bible and Missionary Training Institute that's working there, been working there for a number of years and he has a church plant but he's asking other missionaries to join him, but there's no place to live for them to base, so we're helping them build that, and um, so things like that. We're also helping with the new students coming to the school. We helped about 34 new students this year with scholarships. Uh, that's about $1,800, I think it is, for um, $1,080, I'm sorry, $1,080 for a year in the Bible school, and that includes all their food and place to stay and uh, in the dorms and also giving the teachers a modest uh, income so they can teach full time. So all of that, uh, many of those students coming from places, a lot of them are now coming from 
Sudan, the Nuba Mountains of Sudan to be trained. We have about 10 of the former students that have graduated that are back there working as missionaries and raising up more. And that area has been bombed for about 20 years by Khartoum, a lot of uh, trouble there. But now there's more peace, but as you know in the papers and in the news that Sudan is in kind of a civil war right now. And there's a lot of fighting in the capital, but it hasn't reached, thank God, the new mountains. But we have missionaries working there that were helping. This November and December, I was up there in the Nuba Mountains along with a, a small team of us. Went to the Nuba Mountains. We went also to Sudan and to Kenya and various works that we're helping to support. So that's what we're trying to be a support to the, the graduates and helping get more missionaries into the field, uh, national missionaries into Africa in the places that have yet to be reached. Jesus said the gospel shall be preached, amen, in all the earth as a witness unto all nations and then the end shall come. So we want to hasten the return of the Lord, amen. <laughs> and part of that is we need to do our job. And uh, of course that personally in our witness, we need to be active in proclaiming Jesus Christ and the gospel everywhere we go, all throughout our life, in every circumstance, look for opportunities, take advantage of every opportunity to share Jesus Christ, and then we want to help it go to the ends of the earth. And that's what our ministry is about. We hope, if the Lord tarries and the Lord wills, that we can get back into India. Uh, maybe if there's a change in the leadership and the central government there, but right now, it's a very hostile environment. They're, they're attacking Christians and Christian workers and pastors, and uh, it's a hard environment right now for the gospel to go forth, and they're stopping the money supply. They threw out Compassion International, who was helping so many children. They, they cut their foreign currency number off. They've thrown out um, World Vision and Gospel for Asia, very large organizations that were bringing a lot of funds in for the preaching of the gospel and for the care of children, but um, they've pushed so many out. Like I said, 20,000 organizations have lost their foreign currency numbers, so, so we've had to refocus, but now we're in Africa helping there, so that's where, as you, if you donate to World Outreach Ministries, you can read our newsletter, you can see the specific projects that we're constantly working on, and if you want to help with that. Uh, that's where your donations will go. So thank you very much, and God bless you. It's such a joy to be here. Can we open our Bibles to Colossians this morning? Colossians chapter 3. Familiar to most of us, probably. The Lord laid this on my heart to share with you today. Colossians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. It says, If you then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on the things of this earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall we appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when you lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, and lie not one to another, seeing that you have put, on the, you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So Paul is saying here, if you be risen with Christ, the, the NIV says, since you have been risen, and I like the best translation, we, for this particular word here, it says, in light of the fact that you are risen with Christ, seek, seek those things that are above. Set your affection on things above. Because of our new identity in Christ, we died with Christ, we were buried with Christ, and now we're risen with Christ, and now we're waiting 
for Christ's soon return. When Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. In light of those facts and our identity in Christ, seek those things that are above. The word is zeteo in the Greek. It means pursue after or devote serious effort towards. It's the same word that was used when Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek as your primary purpose, above everything else, as first place in your life. Seek the kingdom of God. Seek the things that are above. Set your affection, set your focus on things above. Focus your mind, focus your thoughts on things above. Because you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. The Amplified says, set your minds and keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things, not on the things that are on the earth, which have only temporal value. So God's calling us, through the Apostle Paul's letter here to the Colossians, that we need to seek the things that are above, pursue after the things that are above, and set our affections, our thoughts, and our attention on things above, not on the things of this earth. The focus of the Christian life is upward. The things that really matter are in heaven. Amen? Amen. Our names are written where? In heaven. Amen? Many of our loved ones are in heaven. Our citizenship, our legal residency is in heaven. And above all, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is in heaven. Therefore, our calling is to seek the things of heaven, to maintain a heavenly, Christ-centered mind. John Lightfoot says this, he says, Practically, to seek the things above involves giving your attention to Jesus, giving him first place in everything, giving him priority, desiring him above anything on earth, continually making a deliberate choice to follow him, to obey him, and to think about and meditate on his life-giving word. The things of Christ and of heaven are to consume our life and mind. The new life in Christ requires a completely new mental orientation. Now, if we set, and as we set our mind on things above, it's going to radically affect how we live on earth. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Setting our mind on things above is going to affect us in four ways. The first way Paul transitions in verse 5 after saying, seek the things that are above, set your affection on things above. Then he transfers to verse 5. He says, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. The first thing that is we set our affections on things above, it's going to motivate us to live holy lives, to put to death whatever belongs to our earthly nature, to get rid of sin in our life. Romans 6.1 says, What shall we say therefore? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And then in verse 11, he says that we're no longer to do, we're to reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we're not to let sin, in verse 12, reign in our mortal bodies that we should obey it in the lust thereof, but we're to let righteousness, amen? We're to put on righteousness and follow after the path of God. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, we're told to, what? Present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable, which is our reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. That word is metamorpho in the Greek. It's where we get the word metamorphosis from in English. It means to change from one thing to another, like a caterpillar to a butterfly, be metamorphosized, be changed, be transformed. How? Through the renewing of your mind 
that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable, acceptable good and perfect will of God. So how are we transformed through the renewing, setting our mind on things above, focusing our thoughts on heavenly things, letting the word of God control our thoughts and be uppermost in our mind. That brings transformation in our life. That motivates us to put off all sin, to mortify, to put to death the evil deeds of the body and put on Christ. Put on the new life in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that ye may put on the new man which is created after God in righteousness and true holiness. So as we focus, as we seek, as we pursue after the things above, as we set our mind on things above and not on the things of this earth, this will motivate us and help us to get rid of all sin and to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit in our life. The second thing setting our affections on things or our minds on things above will do, it will completely change the way we view money and material things. How many know that everything on this earth is temporal, meaning it's passing away? Paul said, naked we came into this world and naked we leave. I heard one preacher say, I've never seen a U-Haul truck behind a hearse. Jesus had quite a lot to say about money and material things. In Mark chapter 10, remember the rich young ruler came to him and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Why do you call me good? There's none good but God. In other words, he was trying to show this man, I'm the Messiah, I am God. And he said, you know the commandments, and he quoted six of them, Jesus gave six of the commandments, this do and you shall live. And the man said, well, all of these I've kept from my youth up. And it says, Jesus loved him. And he said, one thing you lack, sell all you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come, take up your cross and follow me. And the Bible says he went away, what, sorrowful, because he had great possessions, he had great wealth. And Jesus said, how hard it is for those that are rich to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because of the first commandment that Jesus did not quote, but the problem that this man had was with the first commandment. I am the Lord thy God that shall have no other gods before me. He was unwilling to give up his pursuit of material things in order to pursue after Jesus and the kingdom of God. Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. Amen? He said either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Turn over to Luke chapter 12, please. We have a story in Luke chapter 12. Jesus is teaching, and somebody interrupts or speaks up and says in verse 13, Brother, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, Master, tell, or teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And then in verse 14, Jesus said, who made me judge and arbitrator over you? In other words, this has nothing to do with me. This is not what I came for. And then he says in verse 15, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things which he possesses. In another translation, it says, Be careful to guard yourselves from every kind of greed. Life is not about having a lot of material possessions. We just read, Paul said, covetousness is idolatry. Covetousness is loving, seeking, serving material things in place of God. The Apostle Paul told Timothy, Having food and clothing or covering, be content. He said, godliness with contentment is great gain. 
He said those that want to get rich fall into temptation and into many hurtful and harmful desires that plunge men in ruin and destruction, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. In Ecclesiastes 5.10 it says, He that loveth money will never be satisfied with money. One multimillionaire was asked, How much money is enough? He said, Just a little bit more than I have right now. And then here in chapter 12, verse 16, he gives a parable. Jesus speaks the parable of the rich farmer. He spake a parable of them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall these things be that thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich towards God. So here's this parable an illustrative story of this rich, wealthy businessman. He's a farmer. He worked hard. He saved well. In today's standards, his 401k was bulging. He was doing well. His crops were doing well. And he was thinking in himself, you know, what should I do with all of this? And he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pull down my barns and build bigger barns and lay up all this excess for myself and say to my soul, you know, just enjoy yourself. You have a big nest egg for retirement, but there's some fallacies in this man's thinking, and that's what I just quickly want to point out under this point, that if we set our focus on things above, it will completely change the way we view money and material things. The first fallacy is this man gave no evidence that he acknowledged or was thankful to God for his material blessings, his material wealth. That's the fallacy of pride. The big problem with material prosperity is a lot of times it brings pride into people's hearts. And they think somehow by their own wisdom and their own strength and their own power, they've accumulated all these things. Remember what God warned his people as Deuteronomy 8, when they came into the land, it was going to be a great land with water and their crops would be blessed and they would eat and be full. He said, when you're eating and you're full and you're living in good houses, make sure that you bless the Lord your God. Don't forget the Lord your God or his commandments. He said, when your silver and your gold multiply and your, your herds and your flocks multiply and all this multiplication, you're going to be blessed be careful that you don't say in your own heart, by my ability and by my strength and by my power, I got all these things. For it is the Lord that gives thee the power to get wealth, to establish his covenant with you. Make sure you're not lifted up in pride. This man shows evidence of pride. There's no thanksgiving to God for what he had. The second fallacy I see in this man's thought in the parable, this man thought he was owner of, of all his wealth, that everything belonged to him. Eleven times he says in verses 17 to 19, I am mine. I am mine. He thought he was owner. He thought it all belonged to him. The Bible teaches that we're not owners, we're stewards. The Bible teaches us that everything in this world belongs to another. Isn't that what Jesus said? If you've not been trustworthy with unrighteous mammon, who will give you the true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with that which belongs to another, who will give you your own? What was Jesus saying? Everything in the world belongs to another. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all that dwell therein. It all belongs to God. We're not owners, we're stewards. The third fallacy in this man's thinking, he was too short-sighted. He was preparing for retirement, but not for eternity. This man had his focus only on earthly things. 
He was not focused on eternal things. He was not focused past this life. And God called him a fool. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose things shall these be that thou hast provided? The height of folly is to live for the things of the world and not pursue the things of God. And the fourth fallacy I see with this man's thinking, he was unconcerned and did not care about the priorities of God. So is he, Jesus said, that layeth up treasure for himself. His treasure and all that he was laying up was for himself. It was for his own pleasure, his own comfort, his own desires, and he didn't care about the priorities of God. Look, Jesus said, take heed and beware of covetousness, greed. How do we stay free from covetousness and greed? Number one, be thankful for everything that has, is in your life in the way of material or financial blessing is a gift from God. It's from the Lord. It belongs to the Lord. Secondly, remember you're a steward, not an owner. You and I are stewards. We're not owners. And we're going to give an account of how well we steward the Lord's resources. And thirdly, prepare for eternity by putting God's priorities first. Use your wealth for the purposes of heaven. Be rich towards God. Whatever God is doing, invest the finances and the resources and the material things that God has blessed you with into that. God is about saving souls. God is about making disciples of Jesus Christ. God is about bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. Paul put it this way, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not proud, high-minded, it says, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, that they be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves. Hallelujah. Amen. Where your treasure is, Jesus said, there will your heart be. If we're putting our treasure into heaven, our heart is going to be in heaven. Amen. That thus storing up treasure for themselves and a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Okay, the third result of setting our mind on things above that I want to talk about today is that it will give us strength to go through trials and tribulations and not give up. Fifteen of the Psalms, Psalm 120 to 134, they're called Psalms of Ascent or Pilgrim Psalms because they were sung by the pilgrims on their way up to the annual feast in Jerusalem. And for many of them, coming, say, for example, from the Sea of Galilee area, that was about a four-day walk to get there. And it was an upward journey, and it was over difficult terrain. For example, the the, the sea level at the Sea of Galilee of Capernaum is 682 feet below sea level, and the sea level of, um, of Jerusalem is 2,550 feet above sea level. So you can see it was an upward journey. Now, how did they keep going? How did they press on? They focused on their destination, not on the difficulties of the journey. How do we keep going when things are tough? Turn with me to 2 Corinthians, please. 2 Corinthians, chapter 4. There in verse 16, it says, For which cause we faint not. That means we don't give up. We don't lose heart. We don't quit. For which cause we faint not. Though our outward man perish or is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. It's our focus that keeps us from fainting. 
Paul says our outward man is perishing. The older you get, you realize we're getting old, we're wearing out, we're subject to pain, we're subject to illness, we're subject to suffering in this life. How many know the Apostle Paul had a PhD in the school of suffering? He didn't just know God and the power of his resurrection. He knew Jesus in the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul's life was hard because of his passionate love for Jesus and his obedience to him. Let me just read to you briefly out of 2 Corinthians 11. This is his ministry resume. Listen to Paul's ministry resume. I was in prison frequently, whipped severely, faced death again and again. Five times I received 39 lashes from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, that was at Lystra. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and night floating in the sea. I was always on the move. I was in danger from rivers and robbers and Jews and Gentiles. I was in danger in cities, in the country and in the sea. I was in danger among false brethren. I worked hard and long. I often went without sleep. I was hungry and thirsty, often had no food, endured cold without enough clothing to keep warm. And besides all of this, the pressure of my concern for all the churches. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul said, at my first uh, trial, nobody stood with me. All men forsook me, but the Lord stood by my side. Paul knew what it was like to suffer disappointment and opposition and suffering. Here he is in the Mamertine dungeon when he wrote 2 Timothy 4. And he's awaiting execution. And he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. His co-worker Demas forsook him, having loved this present world. How did Paul keep going? His eyes are on the destination, not on the difficulties of the journey. He said, these light afflictions are but for a moment. In Romans 8, 18, he says, the light, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. He said, they're, they're momentary. They're, they're like a blip on the screen of eternity. These light afflictions are working for us. Do you see that your afflictions and your troubles and your sufferings and your persecutions and everything that comes this way in this life is working for you? It's working for you a far greater eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things that are seen. Paul kept his eyes on the eternal weight of glory on the rich rewards of heaven, on hearing, well done, now good and faithful servant. On seeing Jesus face to face, who will wipe away every tear, and all the troubles of earth will be over. And everything we did for Christ, and any suffering that came with it, we'll say, thank you, Jesus. We're happy that we've been obedient to you. Paul had his eyes on the eternal things, and this gave him strength to go through trials and tribulations and not give up. The last thing I want to say today, if we focus on the eternal things, if we set our mind on things above, it will compel us to be faithful witnesses for Jesus Christ. We have to remember that sinners are headed for eternity in hell. And the love of God in us should compel us to warn them and share the gospel with them. Acts 20, 26, Paul said, I am innocent of the blood of all men. That's what he said to the Ephesian elders. I'm innocent of the blood of all men. How could Paul say that? Well, in verse 20, he said, I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I've had one message for Jews and for Greeks alike. The necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus. Paul never shrank back from telling the gospel. This is a reference, you know, when he said, I'm innocent of the blood of all men. He was referring to what God spoke to Ezekiel when he said, if you don't warn the wicked of their wicked way and they perish in their iniquity, their blood will I require at your hand. 
Paul said, I'm innocent because I've taken every opportunity to share the gospel with you. Whether it was house to house or in the open air, I preached that men should repent from their sin and turn to God and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, now I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know what's going to happen to me. He said, I'm going there compelled by the Spirit. I'm going there led by the Spirit. But I do know the Spirit warns that in city after city, he says that bonds and afflictions await me. But he said, none of these things move me, neither do I count my own life dear unto myself. Only thing that matters is that I can finish my course with joy and the ministry given to me by the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. In the Living Bible, he said, my life is worth nothing unless I use it for doing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about God's mighty kindness and love. John Wesley told his workers, you have nothing to do but save souls, to bring as many sinners to repentance as you possibly can. So spend and be spent in that work. This, my brothers and sisters, for us as believers, must be our goal. This must be our purpose. The Great Commission should be our great ambition. Christ's last command should be our first concern. What is it? To go into the world and proclaim the gospel, to make disciples of the nations, and to be witnesses unto him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And if we keep our mind focused on things above, that is going to keep us from getting distracted and sidetracked with earthly pursuits. We're going to constantly be reminding ourselves that my highest purpose in life is to be a missionary for Jesus Christ wherever I am. That means on the job. That means in the marketplace. That means at school. That means in our neighborhoods. That means wherever I am, some of us, he may send us even to other lands, but we must all be accountable for the souls that are around us. We've been given this ministry by God himself. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says he's reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19 says he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. That's the gospel. And verse 20 says we are his ambassadors, his representatives, through whom Christ makes his appeal to sinners to be reconciled to God. Look, he's given us a ministry. He said, I don't have a ministry. Yes, you do. You have a ministry today. It's been given to you by God, the ministry of reconciliation. You have a message that's been committed to you, the gospel. And Jesus, how does he make his appeal to sinners to be reconciled to God? We are his mouth. We are his hands, his feet. We are the body of Christ. He does it through you and I. He doesn't do it through angels. A lot of people would want angels to come and preach the gospel, but God did not ordain that. He's ordained the body of Christ to preach the gospel. And he doesn't just do it through a, a handful of specially called evangelists. He does use specially called evangelists, but that's not all. He uses every member of the body of Christ. Every member in the church is his mouthpiece to the lost. It was Billy Graham that said, we made Christianity into a spectator sport. We got thousands sitting in the stands watching and only a handful on the field playing. We got to wake up, brothers and sisters. This is our hour. Every member of the body of Christ is a missionary. I ask you today, how seriously are we taking our calling to share the gospel? How seriously are we taking our calling? Paul said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. It's been committed to us. It's been given to us. How seriously are we taking sharing the gospel with those that are around us that we know are going to hell and are lost? Jesus, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And Paul prayed. I love Paul's prayer in Ephesians 6. 
I'll close with this. It's Ephesians 6, 19 to 20. What did Paul pray? He was asking for prayer from the Ephesians. Did he pray, oh, pray that I have an easier life? Pray that I don't get so much persecution? Pray for, no, what was Paul's prayer? Here he is in prison. <laughs> He's in chains. And he says, he, he said, pray for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul said, I don't want chains or prison or anything to keep me back from being a faithful witness for Jesus Christ. Pray for me. That's a good prayer for us to pray for each other and for ourselves and for our family. Everyone that knows the Lord should pray that prayer. Lord, that utterance be given unto me and that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel to others. That I may be a faithful witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, seek the things that are above. Set your affection on things above, not on the things of this earth. This will radically change the way we live on this earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is profitable to us. You declared that your word is profitable for correction, for instruction, in righteousness, for reproof, for building us up, for encouragement, for all these things. Your word is profitable that we may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Father, let your word take root in our hearts today. Father, we've heard your word. Now we wrap our heart around it and we say, Lord, yes, Lord, we will be obedient to you in everything you call us to do. We want to follow you with all of our heart. We want to do everything you've called us to do because there's the joy. Trusting and obeying you is where the joy of the Christian life is. Father, thank you for your people today. Let your word do its work in each one of us that believe. Thank you that I could be here after so many years, a few years, Lord, to renew fellowship with Pastor Ernie and Sister Joyce and the whole body here. I bless this church in your name, Father. I thank you for the Church of the Good Shepherd. I thank you for the beautiful leadership here and the godly men leading this church and the Word of God that's going forth faithfully. I thank you for each member that is striving to obey you and live for you, Lord, and do everything that you've called them to do. Father, put a great blessing on the work here. Continue to prosper the work of the uh, Church of the Good Shepherd, Father. Bring more souls to you, Lord. Use this body to reach out like never before here in New York and Queens, Father, to bring many souls to you, Lord, at this hour. We know that time is late. Time is short. We know the enemy is angry. We know he's fighting. But, Lord, you told us to be preachers of your gospel, that you've committed it to us. And, Lord, we just pray that each one of us will take that seriously and go forth today and use us, Lord, to touch lives. Use us to bring souls to you. Work through us by the power of the Holy Spirit in us, Lord, as we obey you, Father, as we open our mouths and proclaim the gospel, as we speak to those around us, Father. Thank you, Lord. Bless this church. Continue to build the body here. Strengthen the body. Equip the body. And Lord, make this body effective in your kingdom in all ways. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.